Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about vector spaces, linear maps and similar stuff. And in today's part 4 we will talk about generating sets and linearly independent sets. Moreover we will also define what a basis in the abstract sense is. However, before we start, as always, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please click the link in the description to download the PDF version for this video. Ok then without further ado, let's start with the things we already know. Namely, in the last videos we introduced vector spaces p, k of r. And by definition this just denotes the set of all the polynomial functions defined on R with degree less or equal than k. So the highest exponent for the variable x that can occur is given by k. For example p0 of R only consists of the constant functions. And we know for sure that this is included in the p1 set. In addition, in the last video we have also learned that this is indeed a subspace in the bigger vector space here. And obviously we can continue that as much as we want. So you could say we make the vector space larger and larger while increasing k. And in some sense in the end we reach the polynomial space where we don't have a bound for the degree anymore. And moreover there we have also already learned that this is just a subspace in the space of all functions defined on R. Ok, at this point you should recall our classical linear algebra course where we have learned that we will increase the dimension when we increase the vector space in such a way. Hence by increasing the dimension step by step this would mean that the polynomial space here is of infinite dimension. And then in the end, in some sense even of higher dimension is the vector space given by the functions. Therefore we definitely have to extend the meaning of basis or dimension to include such infinity cases here. So this is the topic of today, we will just extend some definitions we already know from linear algebra. In fact they will look more or less the same, we just have to put them into this abstract setting now. So instead of Rn or Cn we now consider a general f vector space V. And the first thing I want to define here is a general linear combination of k vectors. So you see V1 to Vk are elements from the vector space V and alpha 1 to alpha k are elements from the field F. And now a general linear combination just combines the scalar multiplication with the vector addition. So in short we can just write a sum symbol and put alpha j times vj into the sum. And then we just go from 1 to k to have the whole sum. Ok so this is what we call a general linear combination and the important thing to remember is that we always have a finite sum. So whenever someone says take a linear combination it always means that you should take a finite number of vectors and do this sum here. This is important to remember because at some other points in this course we have infinities. Ok now the next thing I want to define is the span of a subset M. So please note we don't need a subspace here, M could be any set inside the vector space V. And for this you might recall that the notation span of M denotes the set of all possible linear combinations from M. And again please don't forget the sum in the linear combination is a finite sum. But of course still you can choose k as big as you want. Hence in the end what we get here is that span of M is always a subspace in V. And therefore we also want to extend this definition to the empty set. Which means this should be the smallest possible subspace, so the subspace that only contains the zero vector. Hence with both definitions here we get that span of M is always a subspace in V. In other words this is now how we can span abstract subspaces in our vector space. And related to that will be the next notion here. In fact such a set M is a generating set for a subspace if we can span this subspace with M. This makes everything simpler because instead of the subspace U we can just write down the generating set M. 
This means the amount of information you have to give could be way less with the set M. Because you just have to check then if all the linear combinations from M reach the subspace U. And in fact, this here is an equality, which means we don't reach more than a space U. The set M exactly spans U. However, you still could have more elements in the set M that you actually need to span U. And exactly this thinking leads us to the concept of linear independence. Hence, a set M is called linearly independent if each vector we can reach with a linear combination only has one linear combination. In other words, what we want here is a uniqueness in the coefficients alpha. So for example, if we want to span the zero vector with such a linear combination here, then there should be only one possibility for the coefficients alpha j. Namely, all the coefficients should be zero in this case. So you cannot combine vectors in a non-trivial way to reach the zero vector. And as before here, it does not matter how big you choose your natural number k. So please note, in this definition here, the set M does not have to be finite, but still we check all the possible finite linear combinations in this implication. Therefore, you should see, this generalizes the original definition of a linearly independent set. And now you might also remember, if we put both things together, the generating property and linear independence, then we get the notion of a basis. And this thing we now can define for general sets M or for ordered families. And here, ordered family just means that we have a set of vectors with an order. So usually, if we have a set with finitely many vectors, we always would order them. In fact, this is what we have done before, simply because it helps later on. But even if we don't have an order, we can still define the notion basis. More precisely, here M should be the basis of a given subspace U in V. And now you see, the definition is very short, we just need the two ingredients, the set should be generating and also linearly independent. So first, generating means we describe U with less information and linearly independent means we don't use too much information. Therefore, a basis for a subspace is the optimal way to describe this subspace. Now, in general, for a given subspace, one can choose a lot of different bases, but it turns out that the number of elements in such a basis is fixed. Therefore, this well-defined number for U gets a special name. And this should not be a surprise for you, this is what we call the dimension of the subspace U. So you can say the dimension is the minimal number of vectors you have to take to span the whole subspace. And the usual notation we use for that is dim of u. And now you already know, possible dimensions could be 0, 1 and so on, so all natural numbers. However, now we already know that m could be also an infinite set. And from set theory you might know that we can measure different sizes of infinities. So in general, you would say you have to take the cardinality of the set M. And then for the finite sets, you don't have a problem because the cardinality is exactly the number of elements. However, for the infinite sets, you could also distinguish different cardinalities. But I can tell you in this course, this will not be so important. Therefore, we just say we are either in the finite case or in the infinite case. Therefore, we will just write that the dimension is equal to the infinity symbol if the dimension is not a finite number. Okay, now with all these definitions in mind, I would say we are ready for examples. And let's immediately start with the vector space we started the video with, namely P0. Indeed, we have already learned that this is just notation for the set of constant functions or polynomials from R into R. Therefore, it's not hard at all to write down a basis. So let's say we have a basis M given as an ordered family and this one needs only one element and we can say we choose the element that is x is sent to 1. So it's the constant function that has the output 1 for each input. And now we immediately see we get all the other constant functions 
just by scaling this function. So the conclusion here is, since one element is enough for the basis, the dimension of P0 is exactly one. Okay, so very nice. This was our first example. We have a one dimensional subspace. And for the next one, let's take P with index two. This means this now is the set of the quadratic polynomials. Or more precisely, the polynomials where the degree is less or equal than two. And also there, it's not hard at all to write down a basis. And in fact, we can do the same as before, namely, the first element in our basis should be this constant polynomial. And the next one should be the simplest linear polynomial. Therefore, this is just x is sent to x. And then the last one might not surprise you, it's just x is sent to x squared. And these are the so-called monomials. And now you should immediately see, each polynomial here can be written as a linear combination of these monomials. And indeed, they are also linearly independent, and we will talk about this later again. However, for the moment you should see the dimension of P2 is equal to three. Okay, with that said, also something you should remember is that the space of all functions is of infinite dimension. Now, this is something which is hard to write down, but an important example nevertheless. Now, please don't be afraid if you have never seen such calculations for generating sets in linearly independent sets in this abstract sense. We will definitely do some explicit calculations later. Okay, but now the last example here might be easier. I want the dimension of this concrete vector space here. It's the space of all complex valued matrices with two rows and three columns. And now the exercise for you would be to write down a linearly independent set that generates this space. This means you have a basis and the number of elements should be given by six. In some sense, this is already an abstract example where you can apply the definitions from above. Moreover, I should also tell you that for linear algebra, the finite dimensional cases are the important ones simply because there we can still do our matrix calculations even for abstract examples. And how we do that, we will discuss in the next video where we introduce so-called coordinates. Okay, then I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.